All right. Hallelujah. <clears throat> Somebody once said, a lot of sounds in the air. You know, radio and television and all kinds of sounds going in the air. But the only sound that the Lord really likes is the worship sound. He loves to hear us worshiping. And that's so fantastic. I also came across something the other day. <laughs> This pastor was talking about marriages, and, um, and so this particular man walked up to this one other man, and, and he says, uh, do you want to receive the Lord? He says, well, yeah. How does, does, how does he treat me? He says, well, look at my wife. Oh, in that case. I don't want the Lord. Well, why did he say that? Because he knew the situation between man and wife. And there was arguing and fighting going on. And the other part I was thinking of, you know, we all need to have a foundation. For the foundation is our Lord Jesus Christ. But as we start out into the Christian life, very, very important for us to understand some of the basics, even though the elementary. Okay, some of those we have never been taught, and we entered into starting eating meat instead of still drinking milk, and we got upset. And we went to another church, and to another church. Things going on differently than in this church, and on and on and on. It never really got satisfied. They never really matured. And I believe part of the not being able to truly mature is do not even un we do not even understand the basic foundation. So let's take a look in Hebrews chapter 6, verse 1 and 2. We talked about this a couple of weeks ago. It says, therefore, leaving the elementary teaching about the Christ, that's what we should be doing, but let us press on to maturity, yes. Not laying again a foundation, and this is the point, the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, of instruction about washings or baptisms and laying on of hands and the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. Now these are basic foundations. How many of us really know those basic foundations? One of them that we talked about last time was about repentance. <laughs> well, let's take a look first of all, Joshua 1 8. I don't know if I have that on there. It's important for us when we come to church. Bring your Bible along. Bring a notepad along. Write down things. So not because of what I say or what Mike says or what anybody else says, but because we forget. Let's face it. You know, we forget. And so it's important for us to make the note so that we can rehearse it, look over it, refresh our mind, and get going from that time on. It's nowadays with all these screens coming up and blowing up the, the scripture verses is fine. But you know, when you bring your own Bible and you have to look for the particular passage, what will happen? You begin to know your Bible. That's so important. You know, somebody says, you look for, uh, uh, for Joshua chapter 1, verse 8. Boom, there it comes. Okay, so we look at that. Now, could you find that in your Bible? I hope you could. So remember this. This is the, the word of God, book of the law. It shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do 
according to all that's written in it. For then, then you will make your way prosperous. Then you will have success. Then you will mature. Then you will grow in Christ and become more like Christ. You see the importance of all of it, not just part of it. Some churches ignore certain parts of the scripture. I don't know why, but that's between them and the Lord. But the point is the Lord wants us to know all of his word. He wants us to understand all of his word. You know, when, when the person that wrote the Hebrews chapter 6, I mean Hebrews chapter 1, okay, he, I'm sorry, Hebrews chapter 6, verse 1 and 2 that we just read. Uh, there's a thing of the Holy Spirit lighting, leading that man into writing these things down. And when the Holy Spirit leads somebody, you better follow what he says. And so we see this here in this particular section here, that he, he was anointed, and he had a setting of two thoughts side by side, putting down these foundations in the right order. So repentance, first of all, very important to understand repentance. Not just to understand, but to act on that. Okay? Then number two, going on after this to maturity. Of course, God wants us to grow. But just like when, when children are raised up, they go to grammar school first before they go into high school. And so it is in our spirit. We have to grow, come as babes, suck on the milk, until we become so secure that we can eat ourselves. Why? Because you use the Word of God. You know where to look for. You You begin to study the Word of God day and night. Well, you know, it means there that don't forget about God, even at nighttime. And it's important for us to understand these things. So just a quick re repeat of the repentance of dead work. Repentance is not an emotion, first of all. Remember that. It's not being remorse. Being sorry. Oh, I'm so sorry, Lord. Forgive me what I have done. Well, of course, the Lord hears that and he forgives. But repentance is more than that. Repentance is making a decision. <clears throat> Why do you want to make a decision? Because you heard about what Jesus Christ has done for you. And you begin to think about it. The Spirit convicted you. And you begin to believe in it. Yes, that's a possibility. But, and like the Bible says, repentance comes first before you truly believe. And so you make that decision. You change your mind, in other words. You turn around and not doing what you were doing before. And giving it up. And I was drinking and smoking. The Lord convicted me. I repented. I threw it all away. Because of that, I was completely free. So it can happen to anybody. You have a certain habit, hard to break. Repent of it. Turn away from it. Turn around and do what God wants you to do. That's the only way you truly can become free. That's why repentance it's so important for us to understand. So it's resulting in a changed life because you truly meant business. That's the other part. We, we feel sorry of what we did. We are remorse about the situation, crying out to the Lord and help me out. But we never change. We never change. We don't drop what we were doing, what the Lord convicted us not to do. We know what we're not supposed to do. And so we, we never change if we not truly repent of it. Turn around. Put it down. Don't give in to it anymore. And you will become free. The truth will set you free. And that is so important for us to understand about the repentance. It's a humbling yourself. As we see in, in um, 1 Corinthians 11, they talked about the Lord's Supper and all. There were many sick and weak and, di and died and all these kind of things. 
Then it says, judge yourself. In other words, look at yourself. Look why you don't believe. Look what's hindering you to believe what the Lord did. And then it says, if you don't judge yourself, he will judge. He's going to hit you with a two by four over that until you wake up. He said, this is the way you're supposed to walk. Not your way. You giving all that up, if you truly repent of it, you will not get back into it anymore. If you truly repent. If you're just very remorse about it, you know, that's not what the Lord is looking for. That's why this basic foundation, this basic teaching is so important for us to grab a hold of so that we can humble ourselves and it changes uh, it changes us toward God and sin. We have a different outlook on these things. We don't give in to that. We worship the Lord. We know what he did for each one of us. We are acting on what the Lord wants us to act on. And you know, the biggest thing is we prove to the Lord that he is your Lord. The response to lordship. You do what the Lord wants you to do. You don't do your own thing anymore. See, this is what true being born again means. Repentance and believe. Repent of these things. Let go of these things. Don't get back into it anymore. If I would have repented that and kept the bottle in my closet there at work, next day, Eh, one drink won't hurt. I would still be stuck. And matter of fact, I would have turned out to be an alcoholic because the Lord warned me about that. And so when after I released it on, threw it all away, I was not interested anymore. Oh, how did, what a different outlook it was. And what a joy it was to to read the Word of God, to under, begin to understand the Word of God as the Holy Spirit ministers to you and making Him Lord in my life. He died for you and for me. Just think about it. He gave everything up just so that you and I can have His life. Wow. That's a big one. It's a big one. But that's how much God loves you. That's why God brings up these foundational, these teachings to us, to remind us again and again, if we haven't done it, missing out on the true relationship that we should have with the Lord. We're missing out on many and many blessings that the Lord has in store for us. Now, the dead works, but repentance of dead works, includes all acts and activities of being religious. People come to church all nicely dressed up, some not, doesn't matter. But the point is, ah, I'm a church, I'm a Christian. Oh, no, you're not. Just because you're going to church doesn't make you a Christian. You know? Just like somebody says, just because you stay in a, in a garage doesn't make you a car, you know? So it, it's important for us to, to get rid of the really religiosity, of, <laughs> if I say it right, and to not pretend like we're somebody we're not. That's what the Lord don't like at all. He hates that kind of stuff. So true repentance must always go before true faith. So now let's look at the faith toward God. Number two, foundation. Now we know that the nature of faith goes like faith always originates in God's word. We don't have the faith. We have a natural faith. But we don't have this kind of faith that the Lord provides for each one of us. I mean, there's nothing to it for us to come and sit down in a chair and not worrying whether the chair collapses or not. Of course, it depends on your weight, you know. But, <laughs> but the point is, you sit down. You trust that the chair holds you up. 
That's a natural. So you go up to the switch, turn the light on. Just expect the light to go on. You don't have to know all about electricity and all that. Where did that come from? How does it work? And all these kind of things. No. You just have this natural face which is going to work. Unless you didn't pay the electric bill. Then, of course, it won't work. So in the natural face is the faith always originates in God's word, okay? And it's always directly related to God's word. Romans 10, 17. Take a look at that. So faith comes what? From hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. Faith comes from hearing. Hearing the word of God being spoken. You hear that. You newcomer in the church and you don't know much about the Lord. You want to accept the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, maybe. But you hear the words that's being spoken, God's word being spoken to you. And that starts to do something in you. By grace, like the Bible says, you are saved. Not of your own. It was God. God provided, God provided this wonderful gift to us. And he says, you know, I love you so much. I want you to have faith that I have. That's God kind of faith. That's the kind of faith that helps us to truly believe. Now let's take a look at uh, Hebrews 11, 1, the way it described uh, their faith in Hebrews 11, 1. Now faith is what? The assurance of things hoped for. The conviction of things not seen. Now I got a different interpretation here. And it says, faith is the ground or confidence of things hoped for. Expectation with confidence. The sure persuasion concerning things to come. Faith is not hope. Hope is something else. Hope is for the future. Faith is for now. See, we hope of things when we have faith that this will happen. Or, you know, we hope that things will happen. But faith starts right now in what you believe in the Lord. You act on that when you hear the word of God being talked. That's very important for us to understand. There's another thing. How can we please God? Well, of course, like repentance, praising and worshiping him. But take a look in Hebrews 11, verse 6. Without faith, it, talking about the spiritual faith, without faith that God has given to you, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. Do you really truly believe who he is and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him? He will reward you. He will bless you. He will help you. He will minister to you whatever, whatever he has in store for you. But the thing is, to come to him in faith because he loves when we trust him. Because another word for faith is trusting him. Believing in him, trusting him, and having confidence in him. It's very important for us to understand that. See, some people's faith is in their mind only. And their life does not produce any vital change. Any vital change in their lives. But the heart faith always produces a definite change to those who profess it. We must confess, profess the word of God with our mouth. If we truly believe it, what he says. So we confess what he says, not what you think, not what somebody else tells you, not even what the doctor tells you. You believe what God tells you, and you confess that. You speak it out loud. 
in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7 through 10. Take a look at that. For we walk by faith, not by sight. We are of good courage, I say, and prefer rather to be absent from the body and to be at home with the Lord. Yes. Therefore, we also have as our ambition, whether at home or absent, to be pleasing to him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may be recompensed for his deeds in the body, according to what he has done, whether good or bad. You see, that's why it's so important to get rid of all the junk, to repent of that and not to get back into it, because you will stand before the judgment seat. He's going to say, what did you do with my son Jesus? Well, I, I tried to, to do what I can for him, try to obey him and all these things. Did you really? How come you didn't do what he told you to do? You say you love him, but you never kept his commandment. In other words, you never kept specific instructions. See, this is so important for us. If we truly love God, truly love God with all of our heart, we want to see what he says in his word. And we confess that word and we act on that word. That shows him that we truly love him. See, there are so many things that we miss out on. It's a good time to have fellowship. Yes, nothing wrong with that. Good time to praise and worship the Lord. Of course, that's very important. But there's this other thing that keep neglecting to do what God wants us to do. We walk by faith and not by sight. So it's the thing, again, first believe and sight comes after that. Jesus and Martyr at the tomb of Lazarus. Now, I'm, I don't have it on there, but I'm going to read it to you. It's a longer session. Uh, okay, a lot of verses. So if you have your Bible, open up to John 11, and let's try to go from verse 17 through 44. So when Jesus came, he found that he had already been in the tomb four days, talking about Lazarus. Now, Bethany was near Jerusalem about two miles off. Okay, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother. Now Martha, therefore, when she heard that Jesus was coming, she went to meet him. And Mary still at the house. Now Martha, therefore, said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Even now, I know that whether, whatever you ask of God, God will give you. And Jesus said to her, your brother shall rise again. Oh, Martha said, oh, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. And Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. And he who believes in me shall live even if he dies. Now, if everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die, do you believe this? And she said to him, Yes, Lord. I have believed that you are the Christ, the Son of God, even he who comes into the world. And when she had said this, she went away and called Mary, her sister, saying secretly, The teacher is here and is calling for you. So when, he, when she heard it, she aroused arose quickly and was coming to him. Now Jesus had not yet come into the village, but was still in the place where Martha met him. And the Jews then, who were with her in the house, talking about Mary, and consoling her, when they saw that Mary rose up quickly and went out, they followed her, supposing that she was going to the tomb to weep there. Therefore, when Mary came where Jesus was, she saw him, fell at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. 
And Jesus therefore saw her weeping, and the Jews who came with her also weeping. He was deeply moved in spirit and was troubled and said, Where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Now here's the shortest but very important verse, verse 35. 35, excuse me. Jesus wept. That's the shortest verse in the Bible. But it's very important to see how much Jesus cares, how much Jesus has compassion. And so the Jews were saying, Behold how he loved him. But some of them said, Could not this man who opened the eyes of him who was blind have kept this man also from dying? So Jesus, therefore, again, being deeply moved within, came to the tomb. Now it was a cave, and a stone was lying against it. Now here's the other part. Jesus said, remove the stone. Now Jesus, having the power of the Holy Spirit, he could have said, don't move. The stone would have moved. Why did he tell others to do? He wants people to be involved, just like people should be involved with him now after he's gone up to heaven and we're still here. He wants us to be in, involved with things that are very important. So Martha, the sister, the deceased, said to him, huh, Come on, Lord, by this time there will be a stench, for he has been dead for four days. And Jesus said to her, Did I not say to you, if you believe, you will see the glory of God? Here we go again. If you believe, if you have faith, you will see. Not seen before you believe. You have the faith to believe. And that's the, there's a whole story here, in, going up to verse 44. So, and so they removed the stone, and Jesus raised his eyes and said, Father, I thank thee that thou hearest me. I know that thou hearest me always, but because of the people standing around, I said it, that they may believe that thou didst send me. And when he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth! He who had died came forth, bound hand and foot with wrappings, and his face was wrapped around with a cloth. And Jesus again said to them, Unbind him and let him go. Hallelujah. You see, it's this thing where I'm trying to point out here, again, it's the thing of, of believing first before you could see. You had to believe that he could resurrect Lazarus before they could see it happen. It's so important for us. We want to see before we truly believe a lot of times, don't we? We, we? we look at our sickness, we look at our wounds and all these kind of things and say, come on now, Lord, where's the healing? Come on, Lord, you know I believe in you. Where's, where's my healing? Well, I tell you something. There's this other thing of unbelief that sneaks in. You say, well, you said you believe. Well, in a way you do. But why are you questioning the Lord? Why are you looking at the things instead of trusting him? The unbelief is part of our emotion. Part of our soul. Unbelief, when we, we have to see it, we have to be able to touch it, we have to be able just to, you know, to handle it in our own way, that is unbelief. So when we truly trust the Lord, we have to depend on him that he will do it in his time and his way. Not always our way. I was uh, talking about somebody about uh, how come people 
when Jesus was on earth, they didn't have to repent. And Jesus killed them anyhow. How come? How come? Well, that was because Jesus was not resurrected yet. The power of God on earth at that time through Jesus. And because they believed that Jesus could do this, they were healed. He always says, because of your faith, you are healed. Because of your faith, you are healed. Okay? But then after he was resurrected, it becomes a different story. Then we have the Holy Spirit in us. That the Holy Spirit helps us, guides us, ministers to us. All depends on our openness. But uh, <laughs> it's a thing of do we really trust what God has done? Do we really believe in him? Do we really have him as our Lord in our life? The true, true faith don't let go of that. Yes, the, <coughs> oh boy, it's getting late. There's the experience of Abraham. Well, there's just uh, eight verses here. Let's put that on the screen. Romans 4, verse 17 through 25. As it is written, Father of many nations have I made you, talking about Abraham, in the presence of him whom he believed, even God, who gives life to the dead and calls into being that which does not exist. In hope against hope, he believed so that he might become a father of many nations, according to that which had been spoken, so shall your descendants be. Without becoming weak in his faith, he contemplated his own body, now as good as dead since he was almost or about 100 years old. And the, de the deadness of Sarah's womb, yet with respect to the promise of God, he did not waver in unbelief, but grew strong in faith, giving glory to God and being fully assured that what God had promised, he was able also to perform. Therefore, it was also credited to him as righteousness. Now, not for his sake only was it written that it was credited to him, but for our sake also, to whom it will be credited, as those who believe in him, who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead, he who has delivered over because of he who was delivered over because of our transgressions and was raised because of our justification. You see, Abraham was almost as old as me. He didn't have any of those pills that you get nowadays, you know. But he had God. Oh, hallelujah. He trusted God. He trusted him with all of his heart. Yes, he looked at himself. Man, I don't know, Lord. No, I have a question. Huh? You can raise the dead. You can raise... My deadness <laughs> for his honor, for his glory. You know, the same with his wife. Ah. Now, it took quite a while for that promise to come through. No. Some say 20, some say 25, years, whatever. It doesn't make any difference, but it was a long time. And he fell one time. He took his wife's, according to his wife's suggestion, took his wife's maid and, and had a child through her, which was Ishmael. That's why we have trouble with the people Ishmael nowadays, because it wasn't God's will for that child to be born. But after that, he continued to trust and believe in God, that everything will work out fine, and it did. And then the next time we, we see that he takes his son up to the mountain 
and had him carry a bundle of wood. What's that for? Well, we're going to have a sacrifice up on the mountain. Oh, okay. Well, was he surprised? Abraham had to bind him up and lay him on top of that wood. What are you doing, Dad? I'm doing what God says. Um, I know if I do this, he's able to raise you up again. That's what tells us in the book of Hebrews. He trusted the Lord so much that even if he had that knife in through that body of his, God would raise him up. Now that's faith. That's faith. Can you trust the Lord like that? Even if you have to wait and wait and wait for the fulfillment of his promises, it's hard. I, <laughs> I know it. It's hard. It's hard. But he promises and he will do it. So we see, we can learn from him, from Abraham. First of all, he accepted God's promises, a, a promise as being true from the moment it was given to him. Number two, he refused to accept the testimony of his senses as long as it did not agree with the statement of God. You see, if it would have been in agreement with the senses, that would have turned into unbelief. And number three, he held fast to what God had promised. With that, his physical experience and the testimony of his senses were brought into line with the statement of God. Faith towards God is your second foundation. Basic foundation. How is your faith towards God? Think about it. Oh, from uh, wait till you get into a difficulty and see what you say then. You begin to wonder, God still love me? Is he there? Doesn't he hear me? I'm in pain. Can't you hear me? No answer. That's not easy. But if we truly believe God, Truly trust him. It will come. Somebody once said, look at the stuff that Job had to go through. I mean, that poor man sitting in ashes, that's the only way he could find comfort. He had boils all over him. Whew. Can't even imagine. And his wife was a real support. First God, you know, he doesn't help you. Abraham said, no, I'm not going to curse my God. What's that? Yeah. Well, that's my own words. Excuse me, sir. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so anyhow, and uh, then this one minister talked about this, and he came up with something. No, I think it was actually, um, uh, what's it, Myers, Myers, yeah, Joyce Myers. And she says, you know, you might be going through a hard time, but if you hang on there, trust God for the outcome. He has two wonderful things waiting for you after that. Now, how did she mean that? Well, look at it. When he finally got through it, he interceded even for his so-called comforters, you know, which weren't really comforting him. They were just accusing him of, of doing things. That's why he's suffering like that. But when the, when the Lord confronted him and he says, were you there when I did this, when I did that? He had to admit no. So there, there was something that he had to overcome his self-righteousness. That's my opinion. Others might have another opinion about that. 
because God's question, were you there? He had to admit no. So what Abraham, be, I mean, what the Job began to see was that God knows more than I do. <laughs> Hallelujah. And so when he prayed for forgiveness for, for the so-called comforters, but did he get blessed? Double time, didn't he? Big family, riches beyond our understanding. Why? Because he passed the test. I believe it was part of, of Job's test. Help him to see himself. He was somewhat self-righteous. Now, he was a friend of God. Now, forget that. God loved him. God knew his heart. God knew that, that he would turn around and uh, believe in him and trust him for everything. And so he was blessed twice as much afterward. And so it is with us. When you go through a hard time, John and the family and all that, it's very hard. Very hard. But when you get through all of this, there will be a double blessing. That's the good part that we look forward to. So that's why we must hang in there, trust God, be with all of us. And faith comes after repentance. If you truly repent, you will have the true faith. Do not truly repent. You have a kind of faith, you know. And it's just focusing on God. See how much He cares for you. What He has done for you already, you know. The things that I had to go through in my life. I was a child yet already. Coming out of that, I know His hand was on me. Because he had a call for me when I came to this country. Before that, I wasn't born again. But yet, he knew me. He wanted me. And he arranged things for me to become free from all of that. And when I entered into this promised land, what I call the United States, <laughs> my promised land nowadays. <laughs> but in those days, it was fantastic. When I came. 1952, and uh, Lord called me into the ministry, and ever since then, he has blessed me, and I ask him, if I can serve you till I'm 100, I'd be very pleased, if it pleases you, you know, so, who knows, you might have to put up from, with me for another 10 years, <laughs> hallelujah, all right, well, I have some more to talk about, but time is going by. So, Lord, I just thank you for your wonderful love, for your understanding, for you knowing exactly what we're going through. And it hurts you too, Lord. As we see in your word, Lord Jesus, when you sat down and looked over Jerusalem, you wept. You wept. Was because people are hurting, yeah, and people rejecting you. Oh, Lord, we don't understand all of the stuff that you went through for each one of us. Taking all of our sickness, diseases, and everything, and sins and sorrows, all on the cross. Not just from us here, but from the whole world. Only you can do that. That's why you're God. And that's how much you show how much you love us. Help us not to let loose of that love for each one of us. Help us to stay firm on the ground you have given us. Help us to learn to be example to others, to be better witnesses to others. Thank you, Lord Jesus, to be that light in this world, to be the light here in Belvedere, to shine for your honor and for your glory. I pray, as we talked about it on Saturday, yesterday, I pray that this community, that all the spiritual leaders are willing to come together and not argue and fighting about doctrines, but just to 
to come together and worship you, Lord, to worship Jesus, because he is the important one. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that you will fulfill all of this. We have such desires. We have desires for, for a revival to come through, Lord. Yes, we long for that. And it will come, I believe. I believe. In the meantime, help us not to give up, but to want to learn more about your word, about you, and what we should do. If we truly love you, and you say, keep my commands, Keep my specific instructions would be another interpretation. So thank you, Lord, for all of that. Oh, I pray that you bless the people that are here today in a special way, Father. I pray for your anointing to fall on them. I pray for just being healed by you, whether it be in the inner person or whether it be the outer person. Heal them, touch them, draw them closer to yourself, Lord for your honor, and for your glory, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right.